If you don't know who you should be, pick something. Pick something. Pick something that would be an accomplishment. Even do it somewhat arbitrarily, because you, you know, maybe you have too many choices, you don't know what you're interested in. Start somewhere, aim at something, do it. Maybe it's a six month certificate at something. Maybe it's, a, it's an online course, whatever. Pick something, work hard at it, see what happens. And what'll happen is, well, you'll get more disciplined as a consequence of the work. And so that'll make you a somewhat different person. But also as you work on it, you'll figure out in more detail why it's for you or why it's not. And then when you make the next decision, you'll be more informed. It's, it, that's how a self-correcting cybernetic system works, essentially. You, you, you establish a aim and you move towards it. As you move towards it, you gather information. That may shift your aim, but you have to move towards the aim. So, so in and, essence, even if you don't accomplish what you set out to do, that the lessons along the way, that, that, that is the higher lesson at some level. Yes, well, and, and you, let's say you should try to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. But but I say, let's say, well, you get halfway through it and you think, I really know this isn't for me. Then you might say, well, how do you know you're not just copping out? Yeah. And I would say, well, you can, you can set up a check against that by swearing when you start something that you won't switch it except for something more difficult. Hmm. And then, because, you know, everyone has that tendency to rationalize their procrastination, and that's a good way of protecting yourself against that. It's like, I can quit this, but I have to immediately, I have to have a better plan that's more difficult, and I can jump into that. And this is, this is also associated with something like the, the necessary minimum of respect for tradition. If you pick a goal, it'll be a goal that's a social institution of some sort, well, virtually, with virtual certainty because it has to be valuable to other people to be valuable, generally speaking. Um, you want to have, you don't want to be so cynical that you stop yourself from pursuing anything because nothing's worthwhile. That's not helpful. And everyone knows that. And you might say, well, I can't get out of that cynicism. And I would say, well, jumping out of the cynicism may be very difficult. Try just doing something local, just mm -hmm. pick something. You know, if you don't have a relationship, make a dating profile. You don't even have to put it online, but at least you have the profile. You're taking a step in, in that direction. You don't know what's possible and you're not as much as you could be. And so God only knows what you could, what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. And that's the reason Abraham is constantly making sacrifices. And it's archaic, right? He's burning up like baby lambs, but like, well, they're alive. You know, that's something and, and they're valuable and that's something. It's, you have to admit, even if you think about it as a modern person, that the act of sacrificing something might have some dramatic compulsion to it, you know, to go out into a flock and to take something that's newborn and to cut its throat and to bleed it and to burn it might be a way of indicating to yourself that you're actually serious about something. And it isn't so obvious that we have rituals of seriousness like that now. And so it's not so obvious that we're actually serious about anything. And so maybe that's not such a good thing. And so maybe we shouldn't be thinking that these people were so archaic and primitive and superstitious. It's possible that they knew something that we don't. And certainly in the Abrahamic stories, one of the things that maintains Abraham's covenant with God is his continual willingness to sacrifice. And it's so that sacrificial issue is so important because you are not committed to something unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Commitment and sacrifice are the same thing. And I think it's, it borders on miraculous that those concepts are embedded into this narrative at the level of dramatic action. You know, instead of abstract explanation, people are acting this out. And, and, the, and the fundamental conception is so profound that it's really quite, it's quite awe-inspiring. It's, it's breathtaking, really, when you understand what message is trying to be conveyed. You have to make sacrifices. And what do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you. So, well, so you move from the unbearable present to the ideal future. And 
And you can't help that. You have to live in a structure like that. That's your house. That's another way of thinking about it. And if you want to get your house in order, and if you want it to be a place that you can live properly, then you have to plan the future that is perfect. And then I think, well, what does that mean? And it means it's good for you, right? And one of the things that I, I'm, I do all the time with my clinical and consulting clients is try to figure out what would be good for them. But we, we do more than that. We try to think, okay, well, what, how can we set this up so it's really good for you and that all the side consequences of that are things that are good for other people? And so, because people are often also timid about trying to get something that's good for themselves because they feel that it's selfish or that they don't deserve it. So we set it up so that, well, look, we're going to set it up so that it's plainly obvious that this will not harm the structure of the universe. For you to have what you need and to do it in a way that's of benefit to other people, there's no downside to that. And, and so it's okay. It's okay if you reach out and take that. And one of the things that's interesting about the biblical stories, the Abrahamic stories as well, is that God doesn't really seem to be opposed to the success of the people that he's chosen. You know, what happens to them is, as they progress through their journey is they, they get larger flocks and they, they get more authority and they, they, get, they, get more, they get life more abundant. That's what happens. It's, God isn't, doesn't seem to be a miser in the Old Testament. It's like if you put in the effort and you and you accept the covenant and you make the sacrifices, then you get to be successful and maybe successful beyond your wildest dreams. And that that's actually seems to be okay with God. And that's pretty cool given that, you know, that the general notion of Old Testament God is that all he's doing is casting out curses and death, you know, wherever he happens to wander. And I mean, there's certainly no shortage of that, but, but again, it seems to me that that's very good news and that you also don't have to be perfect in order for, to have that happen. And then the other thing, this is the issue about going into the unknown. It's like, well, if you leave your country and your kin and your father's house and you go out into a land that your intuition guides you to, you're going to undergo these radical transformations. This is a sacrificial transformation too because you're, you're moving forthrightly and voluntarily into chaos, right? And that's the same as the dragon fight. That's the hero's story. And what will happen there is that you will transform yourself. And so the call to an ideal is also the call to a sequence of deaths and rebirths that move you closer and closer to the ideal. If you're resentful about something, well, first of all, you should notice I'm resentful. And that's kind of humiliating because no one's proud of being resentful. It's a shameful emotion. Well, so then why are you resentful? Well, there's only two reasons as far as I've been able to tell. One is that you're, you're, being, you're allowing yourself to be taken advantage of or you're being taken advantage of. Sometimes you're not allowing yourself. Sometimes you're a child being abused by their uncle. You're not allowing yourself. You can't, you can't do anything about it. You're, you're resentful because you're being taken advantage of or because you're immature. It's one of those two things. Figure out which it is and then take the steps necessary to address it. Living a life without resentment is a great goal. People are often resentful if they see that responsibility has been abdicated. Why isn't that person doing their job? It's like, well, hey man, step in at your workplace, in your family. You know, and you think, well, I don't, I shouldn't have to do that extra work. Well, you shouldn't be a, a slave. You shouldn't allow yourself to be tyrannized. But if something bugs you because a responsibility is going unfulfilled, there's a great opportunity for you. And this is something I don't think we teach young people well. And one of the things you may remember this that was so striking about the tour was that I made a case fairly consistently that most people find the meaning that sustains them through the vicissitudes of life, not in happiness, mm -hmm. but in responsibility. And that would bring everyone to a halt. It would always make the whole theater silent. It's like, oh, I never thought of that connection. Because maybe you want to avoid responsibility and you can understand why. You can understand why. You hide from it. Like Abraham, <laughs> One of the biblical stories, Abraham, he stays in his father's tent till he's like 80 and then God gets fed up and 
tells him to get the hell out and grow up and everything that he encounters is catastrophic. He encounters tyranny. Uh, the Egyptians conspire to steal his wife. He encounters starvation and war. That is what you encounter if you go out in the world. You think, who the hell wants that? I don't want the responsibility. It's like, well, yes, you do, mm -hmm. as it turns out. It, there's nothing better than responsibility. Now, you know, I say that with some caution. I think that it's hard to say uh, the responsibility. I've been overwhelmed by my apparent responsibility. But I think it's also kept me alive. And I mean that literally. And so. Wait, can you can you go a little deeper with that? I mean, when you were at your darkest moments in the last two years, uh, what whatever that might be, um, was it the feeling well, of, there's of been the many times in the last year where it would have been much easier for me just to be dead? That's constant. So, but no. But is it but no because of something in you, or is it but no because of the, the, the people that you would have abdicated that responsibility to the people? Or is that is that ultimately the same That's thing? It. Yeah. Well, I do think that the two aren't easily distinguishable, but it's definitely that. It's definitely that. You know. And it's it's one of the chapters, the last chapter is be grateful in spite of your suffering, you know. You need a meaning to sustain you through suffering. And it is the case that you find that in responsibility. Well, and so it's good advice for anyone who's at work. You're resentful about this and that because people aren't pulling their weight. Pull it. See what happens. You become indispensable instantly. You'll know everything. And no, and if and maybe that job won't be for you, or maybe that relationship won't be for you, but you'll take your hard acquired wisdom, go elsewhere and flourish there. So, you know, I, I this kid stopped me. I think I wrote about this in this book. Kid stopped me in a restaurant one day when I was walking in. And he said, and he he was he had a gra an undergraduate degree and he was working as a waiter in a chain steak place. Um, and he stopped me and he said, you know, about six months ago, I was watching one of your lectures and I decided to stop being resentful about my job. And he was resentful because he had a university degree and he's working as a waiter. You know, and I, look, I don't have anything against waiters. It's like a waiter can make your evening, you know, hooray. Um, he said, well, I decided I'd start trying at my job, like really trying as if it was worthwhile. He said he got three promotions in six months. Like he's just rocketing up the power hierarchy. Well, it's not power, it's competence, if it's well run. You know, and, and, and places are full of opportunity. If you concentrate solely on your career, you can get a long way in your career. And I would say that that's a strategy that a minority of men preferentially do. That, that's all they do. They work like 70, 80 hours a week. They go flat out on their career. They're staking everything on the small probability of exceptional status in a narrow domain. But it's, it's hard on them. They don't have a life. It's very difficult for them to have a family. They don't know how to take any leisure activity, like they get very one dimension. Now, it may be that that unidimensionality is the price you have to pay to be exceptional at one thing, right? Because if you're going to be something like a genius level mathematician, and you want to do that for, or a scientist say, it's like, you're in your lab, you're in your lab all the time, you're working 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week, you're smart, you're dedicated, you're unidimensional, and that's how you get to beat all the other people who are doing that. It's the only way. But the problem is you don't get a life. Now, if you love being a scientist and you have that kind of focus of mind, well, first of all, you're a rare person, and second, you're going to pay for it. But fine, more power to you. But, but it's a... It's a risky business to do that. You sacrifice a lot for it. You know, and I would say most often, if you're speaking about having a healthy life, that isn't what you do. You spread yourself out more. So, you know, you have a family, you have some things that you do outside of work that are meaningful to you and useful. You, you have a network of friends. Um, well, that, that, those three things alone are, four things alone are plenty to keep you well oriented. And then if one of those things collapses, you know, everything doesn't go. 
Now, the, the price you pay for that is the more you strive to optimize that balance, the less likely you are to be fantastically successful at any single one of them. But you might have a very, you know, if you con consider your life as a whole, that might be a winning strategy. One of the things Carl Jung said, I really liked this. He thought that men went after perfection and win women went after wholeness. So they're different, they're different value. They're, di they're different, there's something different at the top of the value hierarchy. So perfection would be stake it all on one thing and, and look for radical success. Not, all, not that all men do that, because they don't, but we're, we're talking about extremes at least with the regards to the men that do that. The wholeness idea is more like, well, I want, I want, it's like I want one thing in my life to be 150%, or I want five things in my life to be 80%. Well, there, there's a lot more richness in a life where you have five things operating at 80%, but you're not operating in any of, at any of them at 150%. So, and I really believe this because I've watched men and women go through their careers now for a long period of time and one of the things that there's lots of things that produce this but one of the things that I've noticed is that mostly women in their 30s bear, bail out of unidimensional careers they won't do them they won't they won't put in the 80 hours a week that they would have to put in in order to dominate that particular area and it isn't the reason that they won't do it is because they decide it's not worth it and no wonder, because why would that be worth it? You, you have to ask yourself that. It's like, well, you want to be an outstanding scientist. It's like, okay, really, really, that's what you want. Because that means that's what you do. Because you're competing with other people. You know, they're smart, they're hardworking. And if you want to be at the top, you have to be smarter and work harder than any of them. And working hard means working long hours. I mean, it also means working diligently, but in, in the final analysis, it's all, also an additive issue. If I'm smart and hardworking and I can crank out for 70 hours a week, and you do it for 30, it's like, in two years, I'm so far ahead of you, you will never, ever catch up. We were sitting in the first row of the plane, and do you remember the guy, was a young black man, sort of ran onto the plane, he was wearing a yellow vest, he was a, he was a worker, working the bridge or something. And he came up to you and he said, I, I'm not supposed to be on the plane right now. I'm not supposed to say anything, but you helped me turn my life around. I got this job because of you. And what I remember more than anything else is this, he had this huge smile on his face, but it wasn't because you told him to go out there and be happy. It was because you told him to go out there and, and fix some stuff. And, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about right now. Those experiences are so life sustaining. It's so remarkable to have that happen. And that's something I've had, I've been immensely privileged to constantly experience. Although it's, there's also something about it that's extremely painful. You know, the, the, the magnitude of that joy is sort of proportional to the obstacles it had to overcome <laughs> while it was attempting to manifest itself. You know, and one of the things I'm sure you saw on the tour, and I don't know how this affected you was, the, the, the depth of hunger for encouragement that exists everywhere, as far as I can tell. And everyone wants to be appreciated when they bring their best to the table. That's why the assault, the current assault on merit is so unbelievably brutal, because it, it will deny everyone the right to be appreciated for being their best. And well, you might ask, well, when does the best become your enemy? And that's easy. It's when you flee from it. So what did I learn from studying? From studying the terrible situation that obtained in the mid-1980s when the Soviets and the West had tens of thousands of hydrogen bombs pointed at each other, ready to go at a moment's notice. Why did that happen? What did I learn? It was simple. The reason that that situation existed was because I was not good enough. I was not good enough. 
The reason that the terrible situations in the world exist now is because you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. We can solve any problem. We can solve any problem if we used all the resources that were available to us. If we lived properly, we have no idea what we could turn what we're in into. So I would say, you support free speech because it's the mechanism that maintains the sanity of the individual and society. And you live in relationship with the spoken truth to the best of your ability, because the alternative is hell. And if hell is what you want, then you can remain arrogant and resentful and deceitful. But if you want to work to better the world, to bring it up to what it might be, then you speak forthrightly, you clarify yourself, and you act properly in the world. And then you see what happens. And this is the final thing I'll say. I spent a long time studying the Sermon on the Mount. It's a key document. It's Christ's commentary on the Ten Commandments, in a sense. The question being, if you codify the rules by which a society might function, is there something within the structure of the rules that rises above them that acts as the fundamental principle from which they're all derived? It's the ultimate question of human ethics. What is the highest principle? And the answer that's put forth in the Sermon on the Mount is quite straightforward. Aim at the highest possible good that you can conceive of. Whatever that is that you can conceive of, that serves as your God for all intents and purposes. Having aligned yourself with that good, speak the truth and see what happens. That's the act of faith. The act of faith is whatever the truth reveals is the best of all possible worlds regardless of how it appears to you now. It's a guess, right? It's, a, it's something you stake a bet on. Well, what do you think? The best of all possible worlds will be brought into being by deceit? It seems unlikely. You know that doesn't work in your own life. You tangle yourself up in your own lies, right? One lie breeds ten, and ten breeds a hundred, and maybe you put the consequences on down the road, and you don't fall into the pit for five or six years. Maybe you've even forgotten why you fell in when you finally do fall in, but everyone knows that, everyone knows that you don't get away with anything. And so the issue is, well, what would happen if you just said what you thought? Stupid as it is, inaccurate as it is, and listen to people, criticize you in response to shape you and make you more articulate. What would your life be like? And the answer to that is, and I know this to be true, I've worked with many, many people on precisely this problem. Your life gets better and better and better and richer and deeper, but that comes with a heavier and heavier burden of responsibility. Well, that's okay. You use the observation of your own capability to bear responsibility. To buttress yourself against the terrors of being finite. You say, weak and miserable as I am, I can still stand up to the terrible tragedy of life and prevail. And that's good enough. have to conserve the idea that the individual has an infinite responsibility to the direction of being. And we know that. You know perfectly well that you live in a relationship with your own conscience. And when you violate the moral order that's part and parcel of your soul, you're ashamed and hide and bitter. And then you get angry. You can't show your face to other people. You can't even look at yourself in the mirror. And you know perfectly well that's true, even though you may not know what to do about it or how to get out of it. It's, there's a moral order built into human beings. If there wasn't, there's no way we could even communicate with one another because there'd be no rules of communication. There'd be nothing that we mutually wanted or expected from each other. You know, one of the things I figured out is that we're all appalled when we run into another person who is not yet the Redeemer. Every person you ever meet, you're, you're dissatisfied with because they're not who they could be. And you're broadcasting that message at everyone all the time. You're not who you could be. You're not who you could be. You're not who you could be. I'm not who I could be. And we're all facing each other with our emotional displays, pleading with each other to become that which we could become. And everyone knows it. But we won't do it. And it's no wonder. 
The postmodernists, they're the, they're the logical conclusion of the Nietzschean dilemma. God is dead. Value, the value structure collapsed. The specter arises of all value structures collapsing. That's the postmodernist dogma. All value structures have collapsed. They're only there for the purposes of exclusion. They have no intrinsic value. It's a very, very powerful argument. That's why it dominates the universities. That and the fact that it allows people to dispense with their moral responsibility, which is something that's never discussed by the postmodernists. But you have to give the devil his due. What's the problem with postmodernism? Well, if all value structures have collapsed, then there's nothing to do. Because in order to do something, one thing has to be better than another, because otherwise, why do it? And so people who are ensconced in the postmodern tradition are undermined by their own philosophy. They can deconstruct their own deconstruction, in which case they might as well just sit there and do nothing, which would actually be preferable to what they're doing now. <laughs> so how do they extract themselves from that dilemma? They do it illogically, but they don't care. Because the postmodernists, first of all, don't believe in logic. That's a reflection of the logos, which they've dispensed with. Dialogue, they don't believe in, because that's a reflection of the logos, which they've dispensed with. Logic and dialogue are irrelevant. Well, that does bring up the problem of what to do. Well, the postmodernists finesse that by reverting to the Marxist doctrines from which postmodernism emerged. And so they say, well, yeah, you can't get any direction from postmodernism, but we don't we're not going to worry about that because we don't worry about such things. What we'll do is just use sleight of hand to push forward the communitarian doctrines out of which our original hypothesis emerged. And everyone says, well, we'll turn a blind eye to the paradox because we actually need something to do. And plus, to the degree that we're communitarian, we can take out our nihilistic resentment and arrogance and ingratitude on every single person we deem to have something more than we have. And so if you're wondering why certain values can exist in the absence of any value, you have to look no farther than to understand that people who are desperate and chaotic will still be angry and destructive. And they can manifest that perfectly with the moral mask that says, well, I'm not really after what you have because you have a little more than me. I'm speaking on behalf of these people who have even less. It's like, it's absolute nonsense. It's so funny watching Yale students complain about the privileged. They're in the top one-tenth of one-hundredth of a percent of people who've lived in, in the entire history of the planet, much less just the people that are on the planet now. They're dominating patriarchs in training, right? They're baby representatives of the patriarchy. And all they do is complain about that tiny, tiny, infinitesimal fraction of people who have slightly more than they have now. It's appalling. And their idiot professors pat them on the back and send them out the world to do that instead of teaching them how to live. Well, as far as I can tell, the alternative is a proper return to the past. And that is precisely to journey into the chaos, to look at the worst possible thing, and to pull the dead father up from the chaotic depths. That's how you stop being a puppet someone whose strings are being pulled by forces they do not understand behind the scenes. You find out what's great about your culture, this thing that's provided us with everything that we see in this room, this amazing warmth that we're experiencing when it's 30 bloody below outside, the fact that the electricity is on and that computational resources are working and that we can all sit here peacefully and that no one is hungry. In fact, we're too fat. That's our big problem. Oh no, we have so much stuff we're getting fat. Yeah, well, that's a good problem to have. We should have some gratitude for what's been produced that's brought us to this point and we need to wake up and understand what we're doing. That's what the psychoanalysts were trying to do in the 20th century. That's what all the great clinicians were trying to do. And I would say, above all else, that was what Carl Jung was trying to do. He believed firmly that the idea of the divine spark within the individual was a 
was a metaphysical reality by which he meant a reality that actually transcended and, and, and existed superordinate to the physical reality, a more real reality. That's whatever consciousness is, something we understand from a scientific perspective, not at all. It's been represented in our mythologies as far back as we can push them as an independent agent in the world, giving rise to form. That's how we treat each other, that's how we re recognize ourselves, that's how we judge each other. You make your bed, and then you lie in it, and everyone knows it. And that's not to say that you're not subject to random and chaotic circumstances and the tragedy of life. Just because you can do some things doesn't mean you can do everything. But you can do some things, and if you don't do them, then things fall apart. Yeah, well, we're not animals in a zoo. Like we're not, we're not camels in a zoo. We're not herbivores, you know. And and just because we have enough straw doesn't mean we're we're going to lose our unbelievable capacity for destructive creation. And it, we don't know how to harness that, you know. And I've been trying, I suppose, in some sense, to to meet that desire for a call to adventure with what I'm writing and and with my lectures and 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 to use responsibility in this moral domain as a as a as a battle that's of sufficient intensity to engage young people in particular property it's like get yourself together see how difficult that is see what you can do put yourself together stop doing the things you know to be wrong and see what happens put yourself together and there's been an unbelievable response to that and i think it's harmless in some sense or as harmless as such things can be because it is focused it's like change you leave the other people alone or if you want to change them maybe you can do it through example you know but they're not your they're not the problem you have enough problems with yourself it's like well what are you complaining about you've got enough to eat it's like fair enough you know who wants to starve right and so it's even hard to fight against. Well, I should be grateful for that. And yes, you should. But it's not enough. And, and you think about where we came from, our, our ancestors, what they struggled against. And from, from the time we were, you know, from, from our animal forebears all the way up to where we are now, whatever we're made for, it's not, it's not, it's not Twinkies and, 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 and TV. You know, it's not willful blindness and the comfort that brings. It's it's not enough. And and so we need this adventure. And and well, and that's that's something we're going to all have to contend with because if we don't get the adventure right, then we'll get it wrong and it'll lead us in terrible places. One of the things I've said that people have repeated many times and that it's in memes and you can buy it on, you know, merchandise items and that sort of thing. Um, a good man is a very dangerous man who has himself under control. And no one ever says that. So you say to young men, look, like your job is to be as dangerous as you possibly can be in every possible direction and to control that, right? Not to be harmless and, and, and slothful and, and contemptible even in your own eyes. And that way you get the power of the shadow. You don't have to dispense with the anger and the aggression, you can integrate it. And that's way better. I mean, I, I had a remarkable conversation with Jocko Willink. I, th I felt that it was remarkable. It, it was very engrossing. And Willink, he's, uh, he's unlike me in many ways. I mean, he's a physical specimen of sort of unparalleled proportions <laughs> to begin with. He's about two feet thick, you know? And he's this military guy, highly disciplined and also extraordinarily morally integrated. And he's he's an admirable person because the danger is right there under the surface. But it ha he has it rather than it having him. And we, we're uncomfortable with the idea that that's the proper route for socialization. We teach our children, try to teach our children that only, you know, cooperative games are access acceptable. And, they know in their hearts that that's a complete bloody lie. 
It's not technically sustainable. It's not even conceptually correct. It, I'm not saying I've solved it. I talk to Bjorn about this a lot. It's like, I love your message. Wouldn't it be wonderful to eradicate absolute poverty? And he does this great job technically of rank ordering global concerns, doing a cost benefit analysis that's methodologically rigorous and saying, look, we can, we can demote money here. We'll get a 20 to one return, mostly in child nutrition, as it turns out. Couldn't we do an immense amount of good with targeted spending? And th the answer is clearly yes. We could eradicate child um, poverty in the next 15 years. We probably will. We could do great things, but we don't know how to sell it. And that's a huge problem. I've never had more of a response from a crowd than when I draw a relationship between responsibility and meaning. Without fail, that brings the crowd to silence. And it's because that connection hasn't been made explicit sufficiently, I, I would say, is that we find meaning in responsibility. And there is a messianic call that's embedded in this. And you can translate that into get yourself together, see what you could become. And you know, much of beyond order is exactly that. It's push your limits, move beyond yourself, discipline yourself, but move beyond that discipline. Don't let that order constrain who you could be because it's not a high enough order yet. And, and I would say, it looks like that is attractive to, to young people and per, perhaps specifically to young men, but not only to young men and not only to the young. So, well, that's a problem that we have to address is, you know, we are doing a lot of things right, but we're not, it's not romantic enough. The clinical experience and my lecturing experience has been unbelievably positive in the main. And the clinical experience was positive because I was always on the side of the per of the part of the person that was oriented towards their their own health and improvement. That was part of our contractual pact. In some, I'd often make that explicit. It's like I'm not here for unconditional positive regard. I'm on the side of the part of you that wants everything to be better, and we're going to discover where that is, and we're going to work to facilitate it. And people loved that, and it was so gratifying to engage in that work. It was constantly positive. I worked with a huge variety of people from people who were had nothing, no gifts, and, and were just off the edges of the world to people who were unbelievably talented and gifted, the whole gamut. And that was, that was absolutely wonderful to see that range of people. And the lecturing has been the same way. Like the lecture tour I did was immensely positive, too much positive even. You wouldn't think that would be possible, but it, it is possible. Um, and I, I'm very positively oriented towards human beings in the main, despite, I think we're great, flawed and terribly, but, but no wonder, no wonder. I mean, the burden we bear is, is absolutely, it's absurd. The existentialists made much of that. We have an absurd existence. We're aware of our own mortality, God, and we're animals. We're aware of our own mortality. What a burden, and yet here we are, and, and much of the time we're not corrupt and horrible. It's a miracle. So, you know, it's a word of encouragement, and that's what people are responding so positively to in a, in a time where everyone is told this story that, you know, human activity is all a struggle for power and that we're fundamentally a destructive force and that we should rein ourselves in, and and I'm, I, I'm not selling that message it's a word of encouragement you're you could be more than you are and wouldn't that be great for everyone including you one of the things solzhenitsyn said about hedonism he said the doctrine that life is for happiness is invalidated by this, the first sound of the jackboots kicking in your door. And so then the question is, well, what do you do in the face of suffering when your philosophy is hedonic, is, he, is hedonistic? And the answer is collapse. And that means that happiness as an aim is, is shallow and weak. It cannot withstand suffering. Obviously, because when you're suffering, you're not happy. And if the purpose of life is to be happy, then suffering, when you're suffering, 
your life has no meaning. And then if you're suffering and there's no meaning in the suffering, then you're really suffering. That's right, really right. hell. But then you think, and this is something that's really heartened me. I talk to my audiences, especially to the young men. I say, look, first of all, don't aim at being happy because that's just not going to work, especially when the storms come and the barbarians are beating at the gate. You can just forget about that. And there's going to be times in your life where you're suffering so much you can't believe it. And so you're going to need something a hell of a lot more robust than happiness to get you through that. And then you might say, well, what's more robust than happiness? Or maybe even what's more robust than pain? And then you could say, well, how about adventure? How about adventure? How about we go out and sail the uncharted seas, you know? How about we go and... Jesus, I talked to a guy the other day. He's a driver for me down in the... Down in Nashville, where I am, ex-military guy, special forces guy, tough as a bloody boot, now works as a cowboy out in Montana, you know, a real character. Perfect bloody American archetype. He knew he wanted to be in the special forces when he was five. So I talked to him for like half an hour trying to figure out what motivated him, you know? And he told me probably 10 stories about his life, all very colorful and deep anecdotes, battle and and rescue and physical privation and discipline. And every 10 minutes, he said, I was looking for a new challenge. And then I was looking for a new challenge. And then I'd already done that. So I was looking for a new challenge. And for him, life was nothing but a sequence of impossible mountains to climb. And that's exactly what he wanted. And that's what I think we all want. You know, in, in the story of Abraham, when Abraham is perfectly happy in his father's tent, eating peeled grapes and you know, having his diapers changed, even though he's 80 years old, and God calls him out to it to adventure. And it's very cat catastrophic, right? Because Abraham encounters tyranny and starvation and war and conspiracy to steal his wife and his own proclivity to lie cowardly. And this is all like in the, that's his first sequence of adventures. And you think, well, what the hell's going on here? It's certainly not the case that God called him out to be happy. And I think the right moral to draw from that story is that God, so to speak, has called us out for something far greater than mere happiness. Far, so much greater than happiness that happiness pales in comparison. He's called us out for the adventure of our life that's of sufficient moral integrity to justify the suffering. And that's something. And if you tell people that, if, if you let them know that, you know, well, that makes them stand up and cheer, eh? Because deep in their heart, they know that's true. They're hearing that spirit of adventure calls you to be a patriarchal despoiler of the planet. <laughs> and that demoralizes young men. And that's, of course, exactly the point, because demoralized young men aren't oppressors, although, yes, they are. And they're not despoilers of the planet, although, yes, they are. And so, so happiness, it's like, you know, that's just, that's just... Happiness is a side effect of moral venture, you know, and if it comes along, you should be bloody thrilled. But as a name, it's for, it's for narcissistic three-year-olds as a name. The hallmark of true sovereignty is the willingness of the elite, let's say, the talented, the productive, the blessed, the gifted, to to justify the unequal division of talent by serving to ameliorate the catastrophic suffering of the dispossessed. Now, Nietzsche warned about that, right? He thought that Christianity would devolve in some sense into the woke nightmare that it has devolved into. But I think he failed to give the devil his entire due. And the notion that the highest is the highest because it voluntarily serves the lowest. That's a deadly idea. And I don't think it's an ideological idea at all. I think it's an idea that removes the paradox of human existence. And so, and that, so there's that, but then there's another insistence in both Judaism and Christianity, and I'm not saying it's limited to those doctrines, by the way, that the way to deal with suffering is not to avoid it or to circumvent it with a shallow hedonism, but to face it intensely, head on and voluntarily in its full manifestation. And so one of the things I've realized about the passion story, which, re which Jung regarded as an archetypal tragedy and in some sense a limit case, right? A story so tragic that you cannot write a more tragic story. Right. Is that it drags the observer, and so that's all of us in, the, in Christendom, 
through the entire catastrophe of human existence, right? So it confronts you with the mob, the mob that's after you, that you are also part of. It confronts you with moral relativism in the face, in the shape of Pontius Pilate. It confronts you with the oppression of the totalitarian state of foreigners, let's say, in the, in the, in the guise of Rome. It confronts you with the betrayal of your best friend. It confronts you with the willingness of the crowd to punish the virtuous and free the criminal. And that's the story of Barabbas and Christ. And Pajot told me the other day, Jonathan Pajot, that an alternative name for Barabbas was Jesus. And that what the crowd did was pick the political revolutionary over the spiritual leader. And that's perfect. And then it confronts you with the reality that we all face our own mortality and too early. And the fact that sometimes the innocent and virtuous are punished. And so it, and then of course, there's the horrible, tragic, torturous death, all of that. And that's all signified by the image of the crucifix and what, what, what we're doing to ourselves, even though we don't know it, I'm speaking mostly psychologically, although somewhat theologically, is that we're exposing ourselves to the ultimate catastrophe of human existence while simultaneously manifesting the faith, is, it, it, the faith that if we face that unflinchingly, that will resurrect us instead of killing us. Hmm. That's quite powerful. It's I, something, I, man. It's yeah. something. It's something I've been puzzling out for well, a long time, but particularly for the last six months. I'm going to write about that in my new book. But And when I talk to my audiences about that, you know, and I would especially say this has an impact, again, on demoralized young men and say, look, we don't know the limits to the expansion of your personality if you're willing to face things without deception. And that's, that, that's a variant of that radical honesty we were already talking about. Don't live by lies. Well, life is rife with injustice, atrocity, and suffering. And so what do you do with that? Do you avoid it? There's good physiological evidence, by the way, that if you take two groups of people and you subject one group to a stressor involuntarily, and you get the other group to take on the stressor voluntarily, that the pattern of psychophysiological response is entirely different. It's entirely different emotionally, motivationally, and in terms of the damage it does. And so the involuntary imposition of a threat is stressful and damaging, but the voluntary acceptance of a threat is invigorating and revivifying. But you know, it would be nice if we could be optimistic. And I think, again, the problem with being optimistic is that it's naive. So then the question is, is there an optimism that's not naive? And I think there is. And the optimism that's not naive is in just a, a, a visualization of how strong people can be. So one of the things that I, I tell people, I told my students in my class in Maps of Meaning, here's a goal. You want to be the person at the funeral of your father that everyone can rely on. How would that be? You want to be the person who's broken and, and, and useless and adding to the misery in the corner. And look, I'm not making light of people's grief. You know, I understand grief. But who do you want to be when there's a crisis? Right? Do you want to be the person that everyone can turn to for strength? It's like, why the hell not? Why not that as a goal? That'd be a good goal, because then if there's a crisis, and there will be, it won't be such a bloody crisis, because there'll be someone there that can deal with it. You know, so when I went and talked to these people at the funeral home, I envisioned that. I thought, okay, well, this is something you have to contend with if you're going to be alive and adult. You have to contend with death and suffering, and you have to be ready for it, and you have to be there for the person, because that's all they're going to have. And so... There's a goal, man. And in this time of nihilism, you know, it's what's the point of life, people ask. And, and they're taught that at universities. What's the point of life? Everything's interpretation. Humanity's a cancer on the planet. You know? Well, how about no? How about not that? How about that there's something to us? People say this courage, they say, they talk to me about my courage fairly frequently, and that's not right exactly. 
I, I just learned to be afraid of the right thing. And I really mean that. I mean, I saw an endless repetition in my clinical practice and in my own private life when my eyes were open, the consequences of not saying what was true. It's like whatever hell you might fall into by opening your mouth when you have something to say that isn't popular, it's nothing like the hell that you're going to envelop yourself in if you lose control of your own tongue and mind. And I, like I said, in my clinical practice, I never saw anyone get away with anything even once. And so all you have in a situation like that is what is the truth. Now, you know, of course, you only have your approximations to the truth, but that's better than nothing. And so you need to be afraid of the right thing. And you should be afraid of contaminating your soul with deceit. That's what you should be afraid of. That will definitely do you in. And I know exactly how. What happens is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. The old programmer saying goes. And so you'll fill your head with nonsense and no one will call you on it except you. But you can still that voice if you try hard enough. You just wait until you get in real trouble. You know, one day there'll come a point where you have to make a decision. And the decision is the difference between life and death, or worse, between someone else's life and death, or worse, between health and the suffering that's worse than death. And because you've compromised yourself to such a degree, you will not be able to rely on your judgment and you'll make the mistake you shouldn't make. And then you're done. And that will absolutely happen. So you tell mistruths voluntarily at your exceptional peril, and you avoid the unpleasant truths that you might have to delve into in all their messiness at your absolute peril and the peril of everyone around you. And so if you see that, you become afraid of that. That's hell. And hell is worse than death. So and I mean that most sincerely. You know, the existential psychotherapist in the 50s, taking a page from Heidegger, talked about thrownness, right? The arbitrary nature of our existence. I mean, here you are, you, you have the ethnicity and race that was bestowed upon you. You had no choice in that. You're the victim and the beneficiary of this particular historical moment. You know, you and you're the victim and beneficiary of all the atrocity and the wonders of the past. You deal with your own emotions. You deal with the, the fact of this specific time and place, all of that. And there is a sense of, well, there's a sense of mortality, certainly, that's associated with that with finitude and mortality. And you can easily say, in some sense, that we're all victimized deeply by our own susceptibility to vulnerability and tragedy. And I think that's true. But, but then the question is, well, what's the best way of dealing with that? And falling prey to it. When my daughter was young, she was very ill. And one of the things we told her repeatedly, and which I think she did very well to her credit, was often she was too ill really to be able to go to school because she couldn't wake up in the morning and she was in pain. And, but she needed to go to school. And well, one of the things we told her was, don't use your illness as an excuse. Right? Because you're already in trouble, kid. You know, you got your problems and it, they're serious. But if you can hold on to the distinction between the part of you that can, in spite of this, and the part that can't because of it, and not blur that distinction, then that's one more thing you have on your side while you're attempting to struggle through this. And to her credit, she managed that, and quite pristinely, and that was extraordinarily helpful. It was very difficult at times. Uh, after she had had her hip replaced, she, she couldn't get around that well. And so we decided to put her in a motorcycle course, which was rather a terrifying thing to do since she just had a hip replacement, but she needed to have a scooter to get around. And so she went with her mother to this motorcycle uh, course and they were driving motorcycles, not scooters. And at one point, one of the people who was being trained wiped out on the motorcycle and, you know, it was rather traumatic, let's say. And, uh, she woke up the next day and was too afraid to go to the course. And so we said, well, you know, it's understandable. Why don't you just get in the car and go to the course and see when you get there if you can manage it? And she got herself out of bed and went and managed it. And then she passed the course. And then she had a scooter and could zoom around the city for the next couple of years. And so that was really good. But it was, it was very hard to draw that line, right? Because 
in some sense, she'd been victimized by this arbitrary illness. And, you know, you, you tend as a parent to have an outpouring of empathy, the empathy that can destroy under those circumstances because you, you coddle the person more than is absolutely necessary, right? And you have every reason to because they're suffering like mad. But you want to be a victim and be a tragic figure? You know, and you might say yes, but you wouldn't if you thought it through. So, and then if someone asked me that question, say, in a clinical setting, I would do a little analysis of it. It's like, okay, well, you're suffering from this traumatic experience. You want to get over it. We'd have to figure out what the practical steps might be, and that might be finding somebody to talk to, or there's other ways of dealing with it. But you delve into the practical realm to sort of address that. No nostalgia for catastrophe. I think that's what that means, is that when you leave what's not good, you wash the dust off your feet and you don't look back. And that's a very harsh lesson. It means that there's no excuses whatsoever for not getting up and getting at it. That's what it means. And it means that... It even means that when people are beset with a catastrophe, like let's say the death of their father, that they are prone to use that as an excuse for not going about the business that they should be going about. Because they can say to themselves, well, I would accept. And accept, there's always good reasons. I mean, believe me, there's always good reasons for not doing what you should. That's for sure. The reasons pile up day after day to not do what you should. Especially because you're, you're aiming at things in the future. You can put them off indefinitely, right? because of the demands of the day. But th these stories, they say a, a variety of things, you know, in, especially in combination. They say, when you leave somewhere terrible, do not look back. There's no nostalgia. That's, that's the letting the dead parts of yourself go. And then if you're going to follow the good, there's no excuse not to do it. And, that does, and it means no excuse whatsoever under any circumstances. And then it's taken even farther with regards to familiar relationships. It is, you can't even let them stand in your way. And I think that's all true. And I think I've seen virtually all of that in my clinical practice. Like there's no excuse whatsoever for not getting at what it is that you should be doing. And I think there's something else that's going on here, especially in the New Testament stories, which is even may maybe worse, which is it's absolutely reprehensible to justify your inaction with a catastrophe that extracts mercy from other people, right? There's a tricky, tricky game that's going, well, of course I can't do that. Look at the terrible thing that's just happened to me and say, yeah, okay, I understand. You're absolved of any necessity to move forward because of your current catastrophe. It's like, well, actually you're not. And it's rather rude of you to use it as an excuse. And it's certainly counterproductive. Well, one of the things that I think can be really useful, and this is also a skill that will serve you well for the rest of your life, is to start using a schedule. Like, like a, a Gmail calendar and, and schedule in studying time, for example. Now, so I've got some thoughts about using a schedule. People often don't like schedules because it's like developing your own tyrant. You know, it's okay, well, here's a whole bunch of things I have to do tomorrow. That's my schedule and I better stick with it or I'm a bad person, I'm a failure. And that's not the right way to go about it, the scheduling. What you want to do with the schedule is design the day that you would like to have. Now, some of that's going to involve responsibilities that you have to live up to or your life will get worse. Right. So but I would say if you're trying to start learning how to manage your school stress is like schedule in 10 minutes of homework. Maybe before you go to school in the morning, if you can get up, you probably can't because teenagers have a hard time getting up in the morning. But start with 10 minutes. See if you can train yourself to sit down for 10 minutes after dinner, some regular time, and do 10 minutes of homework. And that's it. Put that in there as a goal. And then maybe if you've done your 10 minutes of homework, you can schedule in, I don't know, 15 minutes of playing a video game if you want, some sort of reward. But start 
start figuring out how to organize your day so that you get to do the things that you want to do and you do some of the things that you have to do in a manner that you think you could actually do in a manner that would be sustainable across time. And that, like the part of your brain that makes you anxious is really unhappy if you don't have a plan. And so one of the fastest ways to start to deal with too much negative emotion, too much stress-related negative emotion is to make a plan and to make it concrete. And so I would say, and a schedule is an unbelievably useful way of doing that. And you think in my mind, well, in your mind, well, why am I filling out this calendar for the week? And so I know what I'm doing so that I'm not anxious, so that I'm doing things I want to do so I have something to look forward to, and so that I'm doing things that I have to do so that my life doesn't go spiral downhill and make myself might make me more miserable and resentful and bitter. And so you can start to use a schedule as your friend and like that'll take a year of practice to get good at. So if it doesn't work well in the first week, don't give up. Just keep doing it until you get yourself disciplined and they are able to stick more and more to your plans. And that that's un, that will help you so much in your life you just can't believe it. So what you want to do is chop up that overwhelming infinity into a set of manageable tasks mm -hmm. and and you want to think well you know some of those tasks might be like well maybe you could put some order into your room you know or maybe you could make your room a little bit more beautiful or maybe you could think of one thing around the house that you could do that would actually be helpful and 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 you're doing that to improve your life that's the point you're not doing it because someone's shaking a stick at you and telling you that this is what you have to do if you're going to be a good person that's not the point and you also with your schedule you think well I'm going to design this schedule for someone I like and that person that I'm designing the schedule for that I like is going to be me and so it isn't the the schedule of a slave master to a slave it's a negotiated schedule that you arrange with yourself so that you can have a decent life. But it's 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 a very powerful tool to have a calendar at your disposal. And if you can learn to use that young, just put a few things in it, put in your classes, put in a few assignments, put in some things that you might wanna do. Just, just start stupidly and badly and you'll get good at it over, and, and soon you'll get good at it over about a year. And that'll change your life like if you, if you if you uh, learn to listen to people, if you decide that you're not going to say things that you know to be untrue, and, that, and if you learn how to schedule your time, your life will change for the better so much that you won't believe it. And that will keep happening more and more and more and more as you get older. So it's a great, it's a great thing to start practicing when you're, if you could start practicing that with, when you're a teenager and you get that under control by, your, by the time you're 18, you'll be absolutely deadly. You'll be so far ahead of other people who don't do any of that, that, that you won't believe it. And that'll just continue to, you'll just continue to accrue benefits as a consequence. Well, the thing is, is that, or one of the things is, is that, you know, you are going to be putting up with other people's problems and troubles for the rest of your life. And what you want to do is live your life in a manner that makes all of that tolerable. And so I would say, with the scheduling and, and with the attempt to speak honestly and with the, the development of goals that are valuable to you, you're going to be occupied enough with your own life and, and see enough of the quality of that life so that you'll be able to actually be able to tolerate a fair bit of noise and stress coming at you from other directions. And I would also say that the more that you put yourself together in, in the manner that we've already discussed, the the better other people will treat you and the less unnecessary suffering and distress that you're going to encounter. And I would say, and I'll close with this, I would say to your viewers, don't underestimate the utility of getting your act together. And another thing you can do is, and this is like deciding that you're gonna stop saying things that you know not to be true. The other thing is you could decide to stop doing things that you notice make you weak. And it, it's a game that you're playing with yourself. It's like you're out with your friends, you do something maybe because you think it'll make you popular and you notice that that makes you feel kind of subordinate and weak and think, aha, I shouldn't do that again. I don't know exactly what it is that I did wrong, but it made me feel weak. It made me feel like I was coming apart at the seams. It's not the thing I should repeat. 
So you try to do things that make you stronger. You try to say things that make you, that make your speech more true and accurate. You try to aim at things that you think are worth attaining and you get yourself disciplined and in order. And that will do, there's nothing else you can do in your life that will be of more benefit to you and to other people simultaneously. And if you could start that when you're a kid, man, I tell you, you'll be so far ahead be so far ahead by the time you're 18 or 19 that it'll be like you're in a different universe. In order to have any positive meaning in your life, you have to have identified a goal and you have to be working towards it. And there is a technical reason for that. And the technical reason, as far as I can tell, is that the circuitry that produces the kind of positive emotion that people really like is only activated when you notice that you're when you're proceeding towards a goal that you value. And so that means that if you don't have a goal that you value, you can't have any positive emotion. So technically that's the incentive reward system and it's the underlying circuitry is dopaminergic. And when that circuitry is activated, then it's part of the exploratory circuit. It makes you, it gives you the sense of being actively engaged in something worthwhile. And that's, you know, you, you tend to think of positive emotion as something produced by reward. But there's two kinds of positive emotion. One is the reward that's associated with satiation, and that's consumatory reward, and that's the reward you get when you're hungry and you eat. But the thing about eating when you're hungry is that it destroys the framework within which you were operating. Right? It's time to eat while well, you eat, and then that framework's no longer relevant. So the consumatory reward eliminates the value framework, and then you're stuck with, well, what are you gonna do next? And so the consumatory reward has with it its own problems, but the incentive reward is constantly what keeps you moving forward. And incentive reward, because it's dopaminergic, also is analgesic, literally analgesic. So if you're in pain, you take opiates and that, that will cut the pain, but so will psychomotor stimulants like cocaine or amphetamines. And so it's literally the case that if you're engaged in something that's engaging and you're working towards a goal, that you're going to feel less pain. And you can see this happening with athletes who, you know, they'll break their thumb or something, or maybe sometimes even their ankle, and they'll keep playing the game. Of course, afterwards, they're suffering like mad, but the fact that they're so filled with goal-directed enthusiasm means that, well, their pain systems are in some sense shut off. So that's an interesting thing, because what it suggests, I mean, then you could imagine, I might say, well, how happy are you that you've made a certain amount of progress? And, if you think about it, what you'd say is, well, it depends on how much progress and in relationship to what. So hypothetically, you're gonna be happier if you've made quite a bit of progress towards a really important goal. And then you have to think through what it means for a goal to be really important, because that's not obvious. Now you could say, you're in this class and you're listening to some information and maybe there's two reasons for that. You might find the information interesting per se, but let's forget about that for a minute. You need to listen to the information so that you can do well on the assignments, so that you can do well in the class. You need to do well in your classes so that you can finish up your degree. You need to finish up your degree so that you can find your place in the world. You need to do that so that you're financially stable and maybe you can start a family and have a life and that's all part of being a good person, something like that. And so that's a hierarchy of goals and you might say that being a good person would be the thing however vaguely thought through, that's at the top of that hierarchy. And then when you're doing things that serve the, that ultimate purpose, then you're gonna find those more meaningful and that meaning is actually produced as a consequence of the engagement of this exploratory circuit that's nested right down in your hypothalamus. It's really, really old. It's as old as thirst and it's as old as hunger. It's really an old system. And so you wanna have that thing activated.